we model faith and, and really represent Christ to our kids and our grandkids. And so I think that ability to be available and let them talk and let them sort through their problems in a safe place. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Helen, you've been here before with yes. your daughter, Erin McPherson, yes. uh, an author, and uh, the two of you were on the program. Uh, Glenn, it's good to get you here because they told a lot of stories about you. <laughs> we just, we want to straighten it all out yeah. right now, but it's great to have you both back. And, and what a wonderful theme and topic. I'm glad you've taken the time to write this book to encourage parents and grandparents to think about the heritage that you will leave behind. Mm -hmm. why, why do we not think about that? I mean, when you think about the most important things to do in life, one is to seek the Lord, you know, to see in yourself that you believe or you don't mm -hmm. believe. God, that's mm -hmm. job one, is God mm -hmm. real? Job two is then how do we get our family moving in that direction, right? So why are we so distracted with that main core mission? I think we get so busy <laughs> and life takes over. And particularly for young parents today with all the pressures they have. And I think that's a great way for grandparents to step in. And we've loved being in that role of just assisting our kids in that. But life takes over. You have a lot to do when you have multiple kids and activities and school. And Yeah, I mean, it's so true. But, man, we got to be careful not to let that be the excuse, right? Right. That's and I, sure. I'm guilty of that, too. And uh, thankfully, Gene will remind me of that. You yes. know, we got to be not so busy that we're... <laughs> missing the development of our kids' spiritual life. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn, uh, you come from a really good, from what I read, a really good, stable home, uh, grew up in a Christian home. Ellen, that's not your story, but I want to talk to you first, Glenn. Sure. What were the advantages? What did you learn growing up? Why was that a positive? Speak to my two boys who are 17 and 15. <laughs> <laughs> boys, listen, here's Glenn. You know, it's funny, as Ellen and I talked about the advantage I had uh, growing up in a Christian home, my grandfather was a, a Baptist minister over 50 years serving God in different capacities, president of a college and these kind of things. Uh, we, we tried to figure out exactly what the difference was and the, the faith that I was able to, to glean from my parents, my grandparents that uh, Ellen didn't, didn't get to have. Um, you know, part of it was it was just something that was going to happen in my house. Every right. Sunday we were going to church, and when I got to college, I was going to church. It was Sunday. It was going to happen. And so I was able to to build a a character that, that just put this in as part of the daily life. So sometimes and, patterns, developing patterns, are really good. Sure I mean, habits. oftentimes they're really good. And those are the good habits mm -hmm. you want to repeat, right? Exactly. And I can say that I wasn't always strong in my faith, but I was always uh, knew that I had to have, it was part of my life, it was going to be there. Yeah. And I think being anchored is what I'm hearing you yes, say. And there's yeah, a difference. Being anchored, especially in your late teens, early 20s, being mm -hmm. anchored by your faith is so critical because you will make steps off the dock. <laughs> You may even splash into the, the water, but oh, yes. hopefully you can climb back to that anchor, right? Exactly. Well, and, he had uh, the spiritual disciplines in place, huh. and I sensed that. What yes. do you mean by the spiritual disciplines? I oh. grew up in a home that we didn't have any spiritual disciplines, although I had a grandfather who prayed for me, and he wrote to me from Finland. Hmm. And that always somehow buoyed me, and I had this yearning to kind of follow him. But in Glenn, there was this background of devotions and prayer and going to church and traditions around the holidays. And that was just really something that I was drawn to and I felt I had missed. Yeah. D did you, how did you compensate for that? I mean, not growing up in a Christian home, yet um, where did the Lord lay that foundation for you? How did you arrive there to where you had an anchor for yourself? You know, it's really interesting. I've thought about that a lot, and I really think that God just grabbed a hold of me. I still remember, and I wrote this in the book, walking in a field and wondering about God and thinking about my grandfather and grandmother in Finland praying for me. And there was just this hold in my heart from little on that I wanted to somehow do family differently, and I wanted to have a spiritual heritage. So it was just kind of something God planted. I think the ideas for this book started 
even when I was a child. Now, coming mm. together and getting married and coming from those kinds of backgrounds, did you have difficulty or did you, because you yearned for it, Alan, the way you did, that uh, Glenn's um, heritage was easy to embrace or did you have some conflict over it? I don't think we had conflict. Uh, my family had a lot of Christian traditions, uh, things that we did at Easter, things that we did at Christmas, and and Ellen embraced those wholeheartedly. She she wanted traditions. We developed some of our own. Um, and I think I had a passion. I didn't have it. So I think in many ways, and I think you would agree with me, I was the passion behind it because I yearned for something different from my kids than right. what I had. You know, building some of those traditions. Some people listening now don't know what that means, what that looks like. Jean, again, my wife, has been terrific at that, doing Advent uh, calendar for the kids and for the foster kids that we've had. Uh, very rarely are they familiar with an Advent mm -hmm. calendar and right, opening right. up a little box every day mm -hmm. and seeing some little token there that represents a spiritual truth. And that's been wonderful to see. What are some of the traditions, uh, Glenn, that your family did that you did in your child rearing? Well, we certainly did Advent, yeah. and Sunday nights uh, during the Christmas holidays were an uh, hour, hour and a half of singing hymns and, right. and reading and that. Um, one of the traditions we've loved is the birthday cake. Uh, we always had the gingerbread uh, star-shaped birthday cake on Christmas Eve. Man, and I miss that one. I'm not a guy to miss cake. <laughs> so somehow I didn't connect that. That would have been a good tradition no for the Note to self next Christmas. <laughs> Gene, we're doing a birthday cake for the Lord. I, I, and it was it was a great little tradition, and we sang, you know, happy birthday. And, and uh, But I like the simple traditions, too. Like Glenn, even though he would never sing in public, would sing with the kids at bedtime and as long as they let him sing, he'd also rub their back, so they would ask for more and more <laughs> hymns, and he would say a blessing over them as they'd go to sleep, yeah. and just those daily reminders of the presence of God in their lives. And, yeah. he, and we're able to, we're really a very unique situation that we see our grandchildren almost daily, and so we're able to do some of those soft things, too. Yeah, and that's so important, building in those... Um, those moments. Right. And that, that's a beautiful thing for fathers to do particularly. Oh, I did really. that when the kids were younger. I'm not as consistent with it now that they're later teens. Yeah, so. when they get to be 10, 12, they don't really <laughs> want dad to rub the back. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'll rub your, well, I'll rub your back as long as you let me sing does not work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I never tried it, but uh, that would be a good thing. How do you connect with older children or grandchildren in your case? I mean, you have 11 grandchildren. So how do you connect with spiritual heritage issues or opportunities with those grandkids? I still spend a lot of time putting them to sleep at night. Because they're nearby. Our oldest you. is yeah. 12. Yeah. So it's we haven't got the teenage years yet where, where things get a little more. Um, <clears throat> we get to talk to them daily uh, about spiritual things. And so that's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, I coached my oldest grandson's soccer team. And yeah. so we, we got to talk as we drove home every night after practice, got to talk about the gifts God's given him yeah. and, and where he is. And and one of the things I'd like to add to that is as the kids get older, and I'm thinking back to when our kids were older too, is being available to hear their struggles. And, and if you look in our book, it's going to talk about relationship being the really the venue by which we model faith and, and really represent Christ to our kids and our grandkids. And so... I think that ability to be available and let them talk and let them sort through their problems in a safe place. Well, and this can be a great opportunity for grandparents. And, uh, you know, your relationship with your kids and your grandkids is great because in part you're close by. You live right. nearby. What advice do you have for the grandparent who may be thousands of miles away for mm -hmm. that nine-year-old grandchild or maybe the 18-year-old grandchild? How do you connect with a a grandchild who's further away. I have a good friend who has grandchildren in those age groups, and um, she, what she does is weekly makes a point of either texting or messaging or emailing each grandchild. FaceTime. Yes, FaceTime, whatever. And she found one week, she, they didn't always respond, 
<laughs> uh, particularly okay. as they got older. And so one week she decided not to, and that's when she got the response. Mm. Grandma, why aren't you writing? Oh, uh, that's interesting. So yes, they like the yes. uh, overture, but they right. won't always respond because they're busy. They're busy. <laughs> but just that connection, and it, thank goodness we have so many ways we can connect today. Yeah. Well, that's good. The other problem can be accessibility. Now, you guys are in a spot with the grandkids being so close. Yes. Does it ever become overwhelming? <laughs> like there's grandkids at home every day. Yeah, never leave. And, you know, the, there's an assumption by your adult kids that, oh, they're, they're there. They'll take the kids. You know, they, we have really good boundaries, but we have an open door policy too. And we send them out if they're going to. But our kids are great that way. But we always laugh because what a blessing we have and what a difficulty we mm. have. Yeah. Because we have to be in good relationships. Well, and that gets back to your original point, and that is grandparents often have more time mm-hmm. to be available for the kids. The parents are in the get up and go mode. They they may both be working, et cetera. How do you manage that tension with your adult kids and the role of grandparenting? And do you have to have good boundaries in that case to make sure that you're disciplining the grandkids in a way that your adult kids want that done? And how how do you negotiate all that? We have learned, and sometimes we've made mistakes, that we don't step in when our kids are disciplining and do things, that our role is supportive, our role is to help them, and to be available for questions, and they're more likely to come to us and say, hey, Mom, how do you think I handled that, or what would you do? And then we'll offer advice, or Glenn will, but we will not step in and interfere with the discipline. And that is so important, particularly when you live close by. Okay, but a lot of grandparents, and Glenn, you can uh, Mm -hmm. respond to that earlier question and then comment on this one. A lot of grandparents find it hard to bite their tongue. Mm -hmm. So what mechanism Mm -hmm. do you use if you're in disagreement? How do you step back? Because it's not your primary role. That's your kid's job now. Can't be. Um, And sometimes we'll have the, the grandkids who have just gotten disciplined come down and they'll complain they're looking for Oma a, and Opa. They a, a want, sympathetic they want, heart. Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> or they want us to take their side. And and so a lot of questions. What do you think? How do you handle? What what would you have done differently? We we try and totally focus on them and not on whether we agreed with their parents or not in the in the issue. And parents will it's amazing. Right now our kids trust us and our opinion, and so they'll come back and say, Okay, so you have an opinion on what happened there. What do you think? And no, that's good. So but, and it's a good to... thing to maintain that trust. Yes. That's a great goal for all uh, grandparents, particularly, mm-hmm. to have with their adult kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some good common sense and biblical insights today with Glenn and Ellen Schuchnecht. And uh, we're talking about a legacy, a heritage, a spiritual heritage is the name of their book. Uh, look for a spiritual heritage at the Focus on the Family bookstore online at focusonthefamily.com slash broadcast. Or call us if uh, we can help you with that, 800, the letter A, and the word family. You use an acronym to help uh, parents and grandparents understand this passing on of a spiritual legacy, uh, RITE, R-I-T-E. Let's get into that and talk about what those letters represent. Uh, The R is relate. So what do you mean by relate? Well, I think... If you don't have a relationship with anybody, you can't speak into their heart. You know, as a, just as a math teacher, let me give you an example. I would, uh, if I had a kid I just wasn't connecting with, the kid wasn't doing it, the first thing I did was I'd show up early at school that day, go sit in their chair uh, and pray. Yeah. And I was amazed, as I shouldn't have been amazed, <laughs> that God would show up and and that day I would get another way to connect. And I think uh-huh. we do the same thing with our grandkids. We, we need to pray for them a lot. How I think we... we can also let our kids know we're praying for them. And I think it's so easy when you see kids doing something wrong. And we are in a role where we're very involved. And so our kids are very nice to let us have that role of discipline when they're not around. But the first thing you need to do is to still let that child know that you're on their team, mm, right. that we understand them when we're there, they, that what they've done may make us sad. But one of the questions, Glenn is really good at asking questions, is 
Is that who you really want to be? Is what you did reflective of the person God is growing you into? Uh, Just no, connecting. Those are good, good things. In fact, you use uh, in the book, and this is something I hope we can post with your permission, just these ideas. Because as a parent, it really grabbed my heart hmm. to think about praying specific scriptures over your grandchildren, or in my case, my kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it works in both cases. But uh, for example, you said for the fearful child, pray 2 Timothy 1.7, which says... The Lord would grant her or him a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Or for the prideful child, I like this one, pray <laughs> Ephesians 4, uh, 17 through 24, that the Lord would melt away any hardness of his heart. Yeah. And another example was uh, for every child, pray Numbers 6, 24 through 26, that the Lord may bless and keep them, make his face to shine upon him or her, and be gracious to him and lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Uh, there's 10, 12 other yes. examples of that, but what a beautiful thing mm -hmm. to do. The numbers is part of the blessing I prayed on my grandkids and my kids every night when I put them down. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I add a little deal. May he teach you courage and show you how much he loves you. Yeah. And I just add like that, that onto there. So I that, like that so much. And doing that consistently. It may mm -hmm. not be every night or every mm -hmm. couple of nights, but consistently mm -hmm. doing that. I like that. Okay, so the R of right uh, is to relate with your grandkids or your kids. Next, inspire. Where does that go? So to me, that's such an important piece because having that relationship in place, part of that is inspiring in them this idea of who they're going to be. And like with Joey, my grandson, when he is arguing or acting in a way that's not kind to his brothers and sisters, pointing out, you know, God made you a compassionate person, Joey. God is growing you into a leader is what you're doing right now, lining up to that. I, I really think that when we show that we believe in a grandchild or a child, that's necessary for them to even believe in themselves. We have to hold out that hope. Yeah. And I find that even for my grandkids or my kids, when they're discouraged because kids do dumb things and they get discouraged on how their kids are acting, is to always be that person who can say, listen, you're going to get through this. Joey's going to be fine. Kate's going to be okay. Hadassah's going to be fine after this. Offering hope to the parents, our adult kids, and to the kids, keeping that hope alive. Now, let me, let me speak to the grandmother or the mom who is gripped with fear and control. <laughs> that seems to be a common theme within a woman. It's almost like mm -hmm. the curse of Eve. Mm -hmm. There's something there about fear and control right. when things are out of control, when moms or grandmoms don't know the direction a child is going. Fear takes hold, and then they can actually do some great damage in that relationship. What caution would you give us? Well, I'm reminded of one mom that I mentored in the last few years whose daughter in her freshman and sophomore year was really very, very rebellious. And, you know, in every standpoint, you would think, you know, we're kind of giving up on her, and her parents sort of had. But I just encouraged her at that point. I listened. I offered hope. I told her not to give up, to pray, and to still love her child, regardless of what she did, what she said, what she was acting. And of course, you set in boundaries, and of course, you discipline. But to love her. And just got this great email just a few weeks ago where she told me that she was so grateful because her daughter did turn around. She's coming to church because she wants to. Mm -hmm. And she said it was on two things, that she prayed fervently and she chose to love her yeah. through the ups and downs. You know, the other thing, and I'd love to have you comment on this, the, uh, the idea when you're in the parenting role, first of all, this is your first go around. Right. You know, and grandparents have the benefit of wisdom in years, mm -hmm. and they've done it. Mm -hmm. You're the product of their parenting, mm -hmm. right, as a child, adult child. And so one of the things that I think a, a grandparent benefits from is that ability to step back yes. and not be overwhelmed by the moment. They can see a little more clearly what years can provide. Yes. And uh, speak to mm -hmm. that, because I think that's why so often grandparents aren't giving up on the grandkids. Right. They see it, they smile, and the grandkids feel it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like grandma and grandpa, they still believe in me, but exactly. mom and dad don't. Yeah. It's funny, the, the book that we wrote is, is far from an autobiography. This is how we did it, and this is the perfect way. <laughs> right. As grandparents, exactly. You learn so much about, ooh, that didn't go well at all. Right. And how can we, you, you, if you process and think about how you would change that, I think that's a critical thing. And, 
and fortunately, we've we've messed up plenty. Yeah. So because of that, mm-hmm. we well, it's true. we were able to write a book that we think uh, mm-hmm. took some of those things that we did right and a, f- a lot of them that we did wrong. And yeah, attitudinally, when you look at the Lord, it's like He was the great grandparent. <laughs> you know, meaning He just had that seasoned approach. The woman at the well, the woman exactly. caught in adultery. Right. It, it, there was this tempered response. It wasn't the law. It was grace and truth. It that was. is what a grandparent mm-hmm. can deliver. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's really funny when you think about it because it was, I think, back to, you know, we made plenty of mistakes as every parent does, but I would say we clung to a relationship with our kids. And I'm grateful in hindsight because I think that kept us in influence. And it's so fun to be in a role that's close with them at this point. And that's because we clung to the fact that we were in relationship with the mm-hmm. Lord. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you about that. The parent or the grandparent that has the strained relationship, how can they begin to mend that mm-hmm. relationship, build that bridge? What can they do to change the moment? You know, I one of the things that I did, um, I decided when my kids were in college, my two oldest were in college, that I wasn't going to go into a lot of debt for college. So I how'd that go down with the kids? <laughs> I opened. <laughs> they were great about it, except for my youngest one that was still home. And I opened up a landscape business, and I would work till dark every night. I'd teach school during the day and work till dark. Um, I broke promises with her. I, I did everything. Uh, the amazing thing about her was how forgiving she was of her dad. It, I had moved, one of the reasons we moved to Austin from Oregon was so that I could reopen my relationship with my youngest daughter. How, how did that awareness happen that you knew that her heart was being crushed? She's a... Uh, a very proud person and I think she had an amazing mother so she just clung to Ellen mm-hmm. and let me go uh, and you could feel it oh sure and see it and sense and it. especially after she went away to college and I could sense that wow I missed I missed that time with my my youngest daughter mm-hmm. huh. so badly and and I'm always amazed at how forgiving daughters are of their dads. I hear this over and over again. I'm hoping sons are too. They, so. And to answer that question, I don't think it's ever too late. And you start by reaching out. And I remember her freshman year, she was a swimmer at UT, and she was very close to me, and she started calling her dad because she wanted that. Yeah. And so we took advantage of trying to grow that. Yeah, which is beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so we have write, we have relate, inspire, teach. I don't think you can teach until you have the relationship and the vision of where you're headed in place. And I think that's where earlier you were talking about how we get so busy in the details. But if moms and dads today can take an idea of where they're going, that God-given vision God has placed on their hearts for their kids, and keep that in their forefront in a relationship, then the teaching and the equipping falls into a system. And Glenn is great on the teaching and equipping. So It's your profession. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, it was interesting. I had a dad come up to me the other day and he said, or it was quite a while ago, actually. He said, um, is this supposed to be this frustrating and there this much anxiety in, in raising a a freshman son? And and I said, I said, no, (laughs) you need to start having some fun with it. Yeah. And the first thing you need to do is you need to make it a game where you are asking questions don't, I said, how much do you lecture your son? Uh-oh. That's such said, an easy thing Uh-oh. to do. <laughs> yeah, okay. said, but I don't have time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, y- you're wasted your time because uh, you can imagine what he did. The Charlie Brown, da, 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 you know. <laughs> and, and so there just wasn't anything there. Um, you've got to take the time mm-hmm. and get those questions and think about w- how you're going to ask a question that is going to... and Get so, inside the kid's head without being defensive. Exactly. That's a really important exactly. thing. Well yeah. said, John. Well, I practiced it just last <laughs> night. Just <laughs> the he, last uh, is equip, and we're not going to have time. So if okay. people want to get the definition of equip, they got to go get the book here, and that, <laughs> that'll right. be good. But what are some practical ways that grandparents can create a legacy of faith for their grandchildren? That's the crux of the book. Um, what are those practical ways? 
Well, I would say it has to start again with relationship, and it has to be a person who believes. So you go back to this right, and then being involved with their lives. Um, and to me, it's less about what you do, but when I think about my grandkids coming over and they're our house a lot, I think, how can I model Christ to them? How can I be that safe person? What can I do today? What do they need? Hmm. So I'm looking and thinking about where they are, watching for their looks, asking them questions, hmm. seeing what's going on. I think with Ellen, her knowing her grandpa, clear over in Finland, was praying for her constantly. And he would write her letters saying, I prayed for you today we've got to pray for our grandkids and we've got to know what to pray, how to pray. And that's where the relationship part of prayer comes in. That's we've, so beautiful. We've got to know exactly what they're doing. How can I pray for that? Te- how can I pray for you to study hard for that yeah. test that's coming up? Yeah. You know, those are the things that we can get into. And I think too, when my grandkids walk in our door and they know they can walk in, um, and, and we're fine with that. I want to be able to stop what I'm doing, look them in the face, and say, how are you? And, and let them know that they're valued. I think it's a great mission. It's the first mission, mm-hmm. right, is your immediate family. So and, I, and you got to give them lots of sugar. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we're going to get lots of criticism on yeah, that. So I'm going to disagree with him right off the top. Yeah, there you have <laughs> Facebook poll, grandparents, sugar or not? <laughs> Every family's battle right here yes. between Ellen and Glenn. Yes. Hey, this has been great. Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.